Hello, everybody. Welcome to our alternative investment panel today. My name is Jeff Lusick. I'm the head of the retail sales team with Horizons ETF. And um, a lot of interest in today's discussion with three experts. Why are we having this today? Obviously, uh, as many are aware, 2022 was a difficult year for both equities and fixed income, leading to def uh, much more interest in li liquid alternative investing, which can offer more tools to the investment manager to help protect in down markets or try to deliver absolute returns in many different market um, cycles. So we've gathered three portfolio managers and experts with us today um, to have a conversation. In general, what I'm hoping to review are, are, are items such as what worked in 2022, what didn't work, what are the strategies, uh, what are your opportunities you're seeing in 2023, and how, how the strategies of these portfolio managers um, will capitalize on those opportunities that they see. So with us today are the three experts. First, Barry Allen is portfolio manager uh, with DMAT Capital, which sub-advises an ETF, um, three of our ETFs, but we'll be focusing on HARB, which is the Horizons Tactical Absolute Return Bond ETF. Barry is on audio with us. We don't have a video with Barry, so um, you will be able to hear, hear from Barry, but right now you see myself and, and our two other guests. Um, we're also joined by Brooke Thackeray, um, who's a research analyst with Horizons, ETFs, and he works on the, our ETF HAC, which is the Horizon Seasonal uh, Opportunities ETF, Seasonal Rotation ETF, sorry, as well as Richard Laterman, uh, who works with Resolve Asset Management, who sub advise our ETF HRAA, uh, the Horizons Resolve uh, Re Adaptive Asset Allocation ETF, a mouthful, Richard. But um, all three did quite well last year, um, relatively, um, much better than sort of the benchmarks that they track, albeit uh, slightly negative in a very difficult year, but, uh, but relatively quite well, and which is why we're, why we're reviewing these today. Um, so I'm going to start um, with Barry. Um, you know, I want each of you to sort of introduce yourself a little bit. So Barry, um, let's start off with you know a little bit about your background, the ETF that you that you uh, are going to focus on, which I've mentioned already, to your investment approach and how you focus on delivering absolute returns through different market cycles. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I, I've been uh, in the investment business for over 40 years now. I've had a pretty much a, have. Uh, manage money in all aspects of fixed income and uh, a series of balance mandates. Our style and strategy is a combination of top down and bottom up in our credit funds. Uh, we're certainly driven by our overall top down macro strategy, uh, which is very interesting because, uh, you know, the, to summarize, what we're trained to do is to look at the set of macroeconomic circumstances that were in front of us and attempt to identify uh, years in the past where it was relevant and study the outcomes. And the way reason I say that is interesting is because we're in a post-pandemic environment now, which never really occurred in any of our lifetimes before. So it's, uh, I, that's what makes it interesting and challenging. Uh, we certainly have a, uh, a macro outlook for this year uh, is, um, I would say, less certain than any, uh, any other of the 40 years that we've been involved in this. And I'm sure we'll go into that uh, going forward. Yeah, I love um, that you mentioned uh, your your years of experience over 40. I, I was I knew it was around 40, so uh, which is extremely important in fixed income. And as not many um, portfolio managers uh, investing uh, these days have 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 
lived through or invested through an inflationary cycle. So quite interesting that uh, we have your experience and expertise on, on the call today. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Brooke. Brooke, sort of your background, um, ETF, you know, that you're going to focus on, your approach, and how you try to deliver returns through all different market sure. cycles. Yeah, okay. So uh, I've got more than 20 years experience in, in the investment industry. I've, I'm sort of capping it at 20, though. I'm not uh, increasing it. It's like birthdays. It's uh, uh, But uh, so I've been working with the Horizon Seasonal Rotation Fund, HAC, the ticker symbol. It trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange. It's actually over 13 years old. It's uh, the oldest active equity ETF in North America, which is kind of cool. I mean, I saw it. SPY was uh, this week celebrated its 30th birthday, but uh, we're past 13 years. Um, and so it's, it's quite an accomplishment from that. And the focus of the ETF really is on seasonal trends of the market. So what we're doing is we're looking at when the market tends to do well, like the S&P 500 or the TSX composite, the broad markets, and tend to overweight uh, equities at that time. And uh, we also focus on uh, sectors of the market as well. So, you know, technology tends to do well at certain times of the year, or banks tend to do well at certain times of the year. And there's a causational factor that underlies that. It, what you're trying to do is you're trying to increase the probability of success. It doesn't work all the time, but you're stacking the odds in your success. And as Jeff mentioned, we put the word rotation into the ETF name because that's essentially what we're doing. We're renting space to say, hey, we're going to be in the gold sector now. And yeah, that might be the industrial sector, and we're just rotating between the different sectors of the market. And but it's more than that. It's, it's also uh, not to the same degree as far as Barry was talking about with fixed income. We don't focus that so, so much on that, but we do uh, have the capability to go into government bonds, uh, currencies as well, commodities. So it's a diversified approach. So you're getting a, a diversification benefit as well. Um, and as far as you know, we'll get into the market outlook and you know, sort of a Sounds like Barry and I agree so far on, you know, as far as the market outlook, uh, a little bit bumpy along the road here. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, 13 plus years of an excellent track record of over 7% annualized over, over that time period, um, which is great. And, and how long we've had uh, that ETF uh, with your expertise. So thank you for that. And uh, Richard, um, yourself, a little bit about your background and your, your approach. Yeah, for sure. I'm Richard Latterman. I know it gets a little confusing with a single T. I'm uh, originally from Brazil. I've been now with uh, Resolve for almost six years, and we're some advisors for uh, HRAA. It's a strategy that is designed to navigate most types of economic and financial environments by deploying what we call an all-terrain approach. So I would imagine you guys are familiar with Ray Dalio and Bridgewater, and I found it useful uh, to use this analogy. They have two main strategies that they're known for. They have their beta, which is their all-weather approach, and then they have their pure alpha strategy. So in a similar way, we focused on these two approaches. We have our versions of beta and alpha, and they have co a low correlation to one another, so there's good complementarity there. We've blended the two in the HREA ETF to create what we have dubbed this all-terrain approach. So just as a reminder, the all-weather type of beta is it's known commonly as risk parity. And it's the idea that you want to own all major asset classes. You want to have your equities that can participate in positive growth. You want to have your bonds that can provide you with some returns during negative growth shocks. And you have your commodities for inflationary periods. So you have these three main pistons in your portfolio. And what you're looking for is to have a balance across the different components. So the maniacs don't get to take over the asylum. And so no single asset class can dominate the portfolio from a risk perspective. The alpha portion of the strategy is a multi-strategy approach. We use things like trend following, seasonality, uh, which Brooke has described so eloquently and is intuitive when you think about commodities, but also pervasive across financial assets. We use carry, also known as yield, and we have relative value. Um, so on to the next question, and I mentioned how difficult the markets were last year. Um, I mean, the S&P was down 18%, the NASDAQ was down over 30%, and I think pretty much aggregate bond indices, typically seen as um, safe uh, uh, fixed income indices, were down over 10%, I think around in the range of about 12% or so. Um, so a difficult year. The traditional 60-40 portfolio struggled as a result. Um, 
even in 2008, your fixed income investments, you know, helped protect you from from the equity drawdown in 2008. But this year, both in 2022, both did not do well. So, so one, I wanted to ask the experts: Is there any precedent for these current market dynamics? Um, are there any lessons from the past that we could learn from? You know, and what worked for you last year, and maybe uh, what didn't work for you. And I'll start with with you again, Barry. Okay, well, I, I think you go back to the fact that this th this market is a post-pandemic market. We've never had a pandemic in a lifetime before. Um, so I think the lesson really was is not to look at history, um, but rather look at the highest probability outcomes. And, you know, what scares me a little bit about 2023 is there's a lot of rhetoric or amongst especially on TV I guess but um, you know every time the S&P has fallen by more than 20 percent or the broad equity indices have fallen by 24 percent or 20 plus percent uh, on average they're up 14 percent the next year uh, every time the bond market has returned, uh, long bonds have returned a negative 20% in a year. On average, they're up 20% the next year. I think it's very dangerous to make those assumptions uh, in terms of building portfolios this year. Um, I, one thing that I'll quote last year in fixed income is there's the measure of volatility, the move index for the U.S. Treasury market um, traded as high as 160 when the long-term average is about 50. So the Treasury market was three times more volatile um, than it has been in history. And that volatility hasn't really come down like it has in the equity market. Um, and I also think that the currency and commodity markets this year um, are going to be extraordinarily volatile in both directions and will probably uh, provide uh, getting, getting those right will be a key measure of success and U.S. dollar weakness the huge part of our macro outlook for 2023. Um, I can briefly talk about what worked last year and what didn't. Um, you know, in fixed income, there's really nothing that worked. Uh, duration went down, credit spreads widened, although credit did outperform later in the year. Uh, but essentially, there was nowhere to hide. Mm. Uh, it if you were long credit, you lost money. If you were long duration, you lost money. Um, and therefore, really, the only thing that worked was short positions. And fortunately, this is an alternative panel and allowed us to do that. Yeah, so I agree with Barry. I mean, we, so we had this post-pandemic uh, market that was, uh, we, we really haven't seen anything like this before. And it really was the velocity of the up and the down on the, you know, the inflation and, uh, you know, even GDP. And so we're still trying to stabilize all those components. That's why the market's having trouble here at, at this point. Uh, so it was a little unique as, as far as that goes, but as far as bonds going down and stocks going down at the same time, well, that's that was that's pandemic related because that's because the Federal Reserve is raising rates not because the economy is strong they're raising it because of inflation and and we're not used to that because we haven't had inflation before but if we go back into history and look you know back in the you know uh, the Eau Claire era, you know coming into 1981 I mean so we did have the time where you know stocks were you know going up at the time and inflation was, was rising at the time as well. So it doesn't mean that stocks and uh, bonds are always going to be related like they were last year and or or, the, or what we've experienced before. And I think, so we're gonna see this volatility going back and forth with inflation. We're gonna see some waves happening, I think coming up. You know, now we're sort of going through a disinflationary bout, but you know, we'll probably go back just like we did in the 70s, come up to another inflationary wave in, in a year or two. 
Uh, and this is just because, well, the Federal Reserve, they overreact. We're seeing this mm -hmm. consistently. And I think we're going to see, you know, coming up, you know, over the next while, we've been spoiled since 1981. I mean, we really have. We've had falling interest rates, and they were always going to keep falling because inflation really didn't, never really presented a problem. And we're being spoiled in that environment. I don't think we're there anymore. I think, sure, inflation, we might get what they call immaculate disinflation, where it just comes, you know, really uh, comes down fast. But even if that happens, inflation will come back because of government action again quite quickly, uh, I believe. And so uh, it's going to be a, an a great environment for liquid alts that are able to respond to these factors and take these into account uh, to, to perform well. It's not This is not what we've seen from 1981 really until uh, 2020. This is a different uh, ballgame going forward. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Brooke. And I guess I was wondering um, if anyone might recall the, the exact last year that both equities and fixed income were down. Was that in the 70s or was that early 80s? I, I, Barry might have that actually. 2018, I believe, unless you take really short-term bills, I believe 2018 was negative for uh, middle to long-duration treasuries, and definitely for for the equity markets as well. But uh, uh, to, to, I guess you're going to turn it over to me, and I'm just going to pull on a thread that uh, Brooke laid Answer out that. there, which <laughs> Go the, ahead. The, the anomalous character of the period that began when uh, uh, Volcker and the Fed kind of broke the back of inflation in the early 1980s. So that period really saw an anomaly and that's where the 6040 came to prominence. If you go, if you take a step back and you take a historic, historical perspective slightly longer from the beginning of the 20th century, you go from 1900 to 1921, 21 year period on average, every year those strategies, uh, uh, on average, uh, the yearly return was negative 1% real terms. From 1929 to 1949, so 20 years there, average 1% for the 6040. Between 64 and 82, negative 1% again on average per year. And then more recently, between 2000 and 2009, you had those two big bear markets between the dot-com burst and the great financial crisis. The average yearly return there was negative 3% in real terms. Again. For the 60-40 portfolio. So really that historical perspective allows us to understand that the period from early 1980s to I guess 2021 was the anomaly. Uh, the uh, Mann group out of the UK, they did a study, they showed inflation volatility, right? We, which I think is an important thing for us to understand that it's not just the higher inflation, average inflation, but rather the volatility around that inflation is likely to be higher in the period that we're coming into. And we've had a historical uh, um, analogy here to, to draw from as well. So from 1925 to 1989, average inflation volatility, CPI, US CPI was 4.8%. And then from 1990 to 2021, that collapsed to 1.3% annualized vol. So it is 75% in terms of order, order of magnitude lower. The big question is, will we normalize from that inflation volatility? And I think the the lessons of history, obviously, in these periods that I cited uh, earlier, we had multiple shocks coming into, right? We had gold confiscation in the 1930s. You had the era, end of the Bretton Woods era and the convertibility of gold in 1971. You had oil shocks. You had uh, bursting of asset bubbles. So the period that we're in now is shaping up to be one where we move away from the Pax Americana, let's call it, this unipolar world order led by the US and we're starting to fragment a little bit more we're starting to have this multipolarity a lot more antagonism in geopolitics and we're coming into a period where cooperation gives way to competition and a mentality of scarcity so this the globalization uh, dynamic seems to offer us a bunch of hurdles when it comes to inflation and it is inheriting inflationary because of this need to remove our dependency in offshore would-be foes, right, for, for our, our basic resources. So you have these dynamics where we're going to have to build for resilience instead of efficiency, which tends to be, which tends to impose this need for redundancy in the system. That's inherently uh, inflationary as well. We also have these shocks. We've had shocks uh, last year from the Ukraine conflict, both in energy and foods, uh, and this opens up the risk for continued 
continue risk from that arena, given the uh, the uncertainty in the geopolitical uh, space. So the, the, these these peers tend to have these the, the change from one paradigm to another, right? The, these inflection points they tend to increase uncertainty, higher risk, and the higher likelihood of outcomes that were previously not contemplated by investors. So with that. Um, and, there, and the commodity discussion uh, we are going to get back to, but but before we get to that, obviously in 2022 we saw the high flying tech and growth stocks sort of tumble back after um, quite a few big years during during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, is that is that a signal that fundamentals are going to sort of come back into to vogue? Um, you know, what strategies can investors look to take advantage of um, if that's the case? So let's go back and take a look at some data points. This is a little bit analogous really to the tech bubble. I know the technology companies are different. In the tech bubble, they didn't have earnings and all that sort of stuff. But let's just go back there for a second. We saw technology run up on you know the whole stories of you know it's gonna take over the world and the valuations got out of hand, et cetera. But really what we want to take a look at is what happened after when the tech bubble cracked corrected. Um, you know. We saw technology underperform, and we saw the growth sectors underperform. I think we're in the same situation here. So we've seen technology outperform for years. It got this, uh, you know, year after year after year, and then it got this boost from work from home. We've seen that, uh, you know, largely being deflated out. But I don't think that represents a good opportunity for technology over the next while, just because it's come back to these levels. Because investors are, I think, are going to, just like they did back in 2001, 2002, are going to be looking for other areas of the market. So last year, they rotated out of technology. They went into some of the defensive sectors. Uh, you know, they also went into some of the cyclical sectors as well. Uh, you know, but so it's really where does the money flow? And, you know, so, so maybe, you know, this week we get a bump in some of the technology companies bumping this up and the technology, we get a little bit of a rally here, which happens even in bear markets. So you can't get carried away with that. I don't see technology being the dominant force in the markets, uh, it being like, oh, this is a really attractive play from, you know, for the next, uh, you know, five years and we're going to perform. I think it's the opposite. I think it underperforms, leaving other opportunities. Uh, for the other sectors of the market and, and a lot it's hard to say you know like Barry was alluding to you know the commodities as being part of the the war situation and and it's going to be difficult to figure that out if we go into a recession how are the commodities going to do because they're so undersupplied but mm -hmm. you know there's some real cross currents and we can talk a little bit about that uh, coming up but uh, I, I think we're in a different world here and you know we had look you know we had five stocks driving the performance of the markets for so long and active managers have all been struggling against that and you know so what do what do what did they do you know so we had to make some adjustments for that in HAC as well we went back and we bought some broad market uh, you know uh, S&P 500 that was really the leader in this compared to the other markets um, and so we adjust, we adjusted for that, but I, but I I don't see that being the case over the next five years. I don't think technology is going to be the leader. Um, I think you know we've seen value uh, stocks actually just starting to come off the, the relative bottom compared to technology, and we can see that for five years, just like we saw back in 2001. Uh, so I, right. I think we've seen a systemic change. Good. And and Richard, your view on sort of the fundamentals and 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 what it what what investors could look at right now. So if you think about that in terms of a cone of probabilities and that cone widens over time, the previous paradigm that we were in, things were a little bit more reliable. That cone seemed to be a little narrower. Right? There was more predictability in your cash flows and, and in outcomes. And people were willing to pay a premium for future growth, for the uncertain growth that seemed a little less uncertain in that paradigm that the tech stocks were uh, able to provide or seems to be able to provide. But the, the, the important thing is, is being nimble and adaptive to the possible shocks that are coming our way, right? It, it's important that investors understand that the 6040 portfolio and the private versions of 6040, right? We talked to a lot of advisors and they seem to think, yeah, I have lots of alts, you know, I have some private equity, I have private credit, I have some VC, some infrastructure, which all tend to correlate with 60-40, albeit with the benefit of a uh, lack of mark to market. So there's definitely a benefit there. And from a behavioral standpoint, that does uh, help investors sticking with 
their 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 investments. But it's unlikely that if the 6040 doesn't work, that these private versions uh, that they consider alts are going to be working as well. So I think this is a, a period for active management in the liquid space, where you're going to have the ability to, if possible, go short certain markets and, and pivot into your positions as the opportunities arise. Use the volatility in your favor. I think that's a, a, a key uh, a component of the paradigm that we seem to be entering into. So, so Brooke, your thoughts on commodities and the opportunities they present, your outlook there? Yeah, so I mean, commodities were out of favor for so long, for <clears throat> quite a few years. And, uh, you know, last year we saw the uptick coming in the first few months of the year when they're, se when they're seasonally uh, expressed as well, uh, which, is, which was good. And relative to the U.S. dollar, even like even if you take a look at gold last year, I mean, gold for for a long time was positive as the U.S. dollar kept going up. It shows you there's some underlying strength to it, and that was true for some of the other commodities as well. And I think that you know, as I mentioned earlier before, if you know people are going to leave technology, they have to go somewhere, okay, uh, from the stock side. And sure, so maybe it is uh, some of the cyclical stocks, but uh, it, it, I think ultimately too, it'll all also be the commodities as well. And uh, I, I think that, you know, we're really, like I mentioned earlier, we're really at this point where, you know, for maybe for the next few years, we're gonna see this uh, increased interest in, in commodities over time. If, if we go into a severe recession, um, if that does happen, then sure, commodities could go down much further, and you know, and on a temporary basis. But if you ask over the next few years, I, th I think we're really looking uh, like a mini commodity cycle here happening, just like what we saw back in 2005, 2002, and 2006, where the commodity cycles, the hard uh, commodities and the soft commodities, did extremely well. Okay. Okay. And and Richard, I know you use commodities a lot within your strategy. What's your outlook, or, or which commodities are you looking at right now as an opportunity? Yeah, so commodities represent roughly about half of our investment universe, both in HRA and in our other strategies. So that they play a, a crucial role in the way that we manage our strategies. So a good example, and I know we've talked about copper here quite a bit, and everybody likes copper uh, as a leading indicator for economic activity, right? It's got a PhD in economics. It, it, it's it's typically at the sharp end of the sphere when it comes to leading indicators. And we had been long copper for most of 2021. We came into 2021, we were still long. Eventually our signal started to flip and we became, we went short copper and then we had a huge short copper position uh, by the mid Q2 and we participated in a drop of 25%. It was, it was our single best position in all of our strategies last year was our short in copper. Uh, so it, it, it shows you that there's uh, oftentimes the narrative gets ahead and prices overshoot. Another good example uh, is wheat. I mean, who could have imagined that a war breaks out in the breadbasket of Europe mm -hmm. and wheat prices, which did run high earlier in the year, ended up down 4% last year. So I, it, it's important to remember that prices lead and drive narrative, not the other way around. Obviously there ends up being a, a self-fulfilling prophecy and a momentum uh, picks up and the narrative can feed back into price action, but it's important to, to, to remember that these things, uh, uh, that price action tends to go first, narrative right. tends uh, to follow. And with inflation and inflation volatility being higher, it typically means that we're gonna be experiencing lots of fits and starts, these overshoots and undershoots. And again, our objective is to be mindful of the risk, but also take advantage of the opportunities that those that, that volatility is gonna uh, present to us. Uh, yeah, and excellent that you can go long and short all those different commodities, both hard uh, and soft commodities. Uh, yeah, and like you mentioned with wheat and copper, I mean, even in natural gas and oil, it certainly I think uh, ended up at the levels that, uh, you know, pre-war uh, when there was talk of, of how, how, how much disruption there was going to be. So I did notice, Richard, that you said you uh, went short the copper in mid-Q2 which would be the end of the seasonal period of strength for copper. So it was uh, right on the seasonals as well. Just just wanted to point that out. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it, it, it was actually the case that uh, I believe Kerry went first, 
seasonality falls soon after and then trend picked up and then we had all of our signals uh, pointing in the same direction, that's typically when we will have our largest positions because there's higher conviction as expressed by our multiple strategies pointing in the same direction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and that Richard and the and the, and the mandate in HRA uses those seasonal trends that uh, that Brooke analyzes as well, and uh, they've served both of you quite well. Um, Not so, precisely his uh, seasonal trends, though. He's he's yet to share those signals with us, but uh, maybe. <laughs> well, maybe we can set that up. Um, so we'll probably end on this question, which which, which is going to you know, allow allow each of you to, to sort of expand on your your views and the opportunities and your strategies. So um, we'll start with you, Barry. So you know, your what what opportunities do you see in 2023, and how do you how is your strategy going to capitalize on those opportunities um, and try to deliver a, a positive return? Yeah, well, you know, I keep going back to uh, anybody who thinks that the pandemic-driven volatility in markets uh, is now past us, that the Fed is closing in on the end of its first hiking cycle, uh, I believe will be incorrect. I think we're going to experience very high volatility across markets. Um and you know catching the timing of that is that for now we believe the u.s dollar is retracing in response to ending of the fed rate hikes that will essentially favor commodities and be somewhat beneficial to uh, equity prices because the majority of s p 500 earnings come 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 from outside the United States. So that's a tailwind. Um, but what concerns me is really what the bond market is telling us. The bond market is saying that the Fed rate hikes are almost done and we should expect fairly rapid uh, movement towards rate cuts. Um, I think the fundamentals call that into question. If the US dollar is weaker and commodities, everybody seems to like commodities. If we, if oil and copper are going up, then inflation isn't gonna to continue to come down at its current rate. Um, and on top of that, the unemployment rate is at record lows, not, uh, and is not rising. And even though wage growth, real wage growth is negative, wages are still growing. You know, I don't have any trades where I just say, you know, buy, hold, and prosper, like um, the old adage goes. Uh, I think that's going to be a mistake. And, you know, people that are setting up 60 40 portfolios, I think that that's going to be very difficult again to uh so i don't see a reversion to the mean and a reversion of last year markets um i think there'll be periods of reversions but in the end um i i think as long as inflation um is remains well above the levels we've had for the last 20 years and i think it will um, that we're going to have much higher volatility and we're going to have the traditional asset managers, a asset management strategies and mixes uh, are unlikely to do well. Okay. Thanks, Barry. Um, Brooke, sort of what opportunities do you see in 2023? How are you positioning um, to capitalize on that? I think this year for 2023, if I had to look at themes this year, um, I'd say that value is probably going to continue to outperform growth. I think we're going to see continue of that. Uh, like I said before, I don't see the technology sector, you know, running ahead and taking away this market, maybe temporarily for a while, maybe, you know, next week for a few weeks, who knows. But overall, I think value is going to continue to outperform. I think that uh, Canada is going to have a back-to-back uh, -back, um, outperformance versus the U.S. just because it is more value-oriented more commodity oriented as well. Uh, so I, 
you know, maybe if we go into a major recession, you know, the banks might get hit there and you know, the commodities a, a little bit. But right now, I'd say that Canada is probably going to outperform the, the uh, U.S. market as well. I do think it's going to be a, a really cyclical market here from all the indications that I've gotten so far. I, I track not only when sectors perform well in their seasonal period, but when they don't perform well. And when, you know, that tells me something. And, mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, with what I'm looking at right now, I don't see a, b a big, huge rip your face off rally uh, occurring uh, on a sustained basis here. So, I, uh, but I do see uh, the market actually lining up really well with, with the seasonal trends. Uh, if we go back, you know, we've had this bull market that's taken place since 2009. And, you know, we saw, we saw that take place and, and, you know, the Fed was juicing the markets in the summer months and they were, it was throwing everything off for so long. So the seasonals a little bit got out of whack, but I'm seeing the seasonals come, come back into tune here. And so they're, they're indicating, you know, a lot of information, but I do see the market continuing uh, with the seasonal cycle. I, I, one of the seasonal cycles that we do follow is the six month seasonal cycle. The stock market tends to perform better in the six months from late October to early May. And that's happened even in this strong bull market. But I think that's, we're going to see bigger disparity or bigger differences in what I call the favorable six month period from late October to early May compared to the other six months of the year. So if we're going to see the interest rates go down, I think it's going to be in that time period, you know, in the summer months into late spring, summer into autumn. I think that's when we're going to see the volatility increase in the markets as well. So I think we're going to end there. We're extremely, um, proud to be partnered with all of you at Horizons ETFs um, and, and, and offer your strategies and your expertise. You've done a great job for us, so we do appreciate that. Um, so to, to our audience, if you do have any follow-up questions, please uh, reach out to Horizons, uh, info at horizonsetfs.com, um, or, or our website has a lot of information, but happy to take calls at our 1888 number or our info at Horizons email. Um, and and help help or uh, for any advisors please reach out to your sales team we do appreciate your support we've had excellent growth over the years at horizons etfs and these three mandates have done a great job for us and uh, and, and our investors and we're extremely happy with that so with that we're going to end um again thank you brooke thank you barry thank you richard appreciate your insight and and all of your uh, all, all of uh, your your input today for our investors Thank you, everyone. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you, Horizons, for organizing.